So many of you know that I commenced a mini-series of sermons on the book of Nehemiah a while back, and this is going to be the third segment of that. And the spiritual and physical and community teachings in today's text are really applicable for us today. And while we see that there's a great span of time, it really doesn't matter because it's all there for our good benefit. Would you agree? So, the last two years, a number of issues in the world seem to attack us and our faith, and lessons from the events of the past, these ancient events, continue to be educational and grounding for Christians everywhere. So before we go through today's text, we need to refresh our memory on the events up to this middle section of chapter 2. So we started off um, covering chapter 1, we went into chapter 2 about halfway, and that's where we're going to pick up today. But before we step up into this text here, just remember that the book of Ezra is interwoven with Nehemiah, and these books were first written and put together as one and separated later, and we have to be careful to read them in parallel so that we get the full understanding of the sequence of events and history and the heavy meaning that goes in some of these chapters. So in chapter 1, we were introduced to Nehemiah. He was, as it says in the last sentence of chapter 1, a cupbearer to the king. A, in today's world, that might be a sommelier, somebody who works to uh, taste the wine ahead of time. And Nehemiah had just received horrible news from Hanani that the world, walls of Jerusalem are now in rubble and that the gates have been destroyed. And when hearing of this, he mourned for days. As he immediately sat and mourned for days, and we talked about that. And Nehemiah, we know, was a practiced prayer warrior of, you know, just renowned when you look at what he did. He had a, a structured way of working throughout his life, praying day and night, and he was able to shoot off kind of rifle shot prayers just before he did something. And that was part of his makeup. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's, um, what would you say, uncommon for him to have direct kinship feeling for the exiles, which are a long ways away. He still felt an intimate community with them. And he demonstrates that through his prayer life, that he, life, that he has a sympathetic as well as an empathetic bond with them. But Nehemiah, as you may recall, was in a very tough position. As an official for the palace, he knew that he worked for the same king who ordered that no one worked on the walls. That's a problem for him. And of course, that left the exiles in their present woeful, woeful condition. No um, walls to hide behind, no organization. And Nehemiah being trapped physically, being in the king's service, a long ways away, had a difficult thing to try and work with. So he couldn't make the king sad or appeal directly on behalf of the exiles because that would put his own life and probably others in peril. And so he couldn't approach the king with his true emotional content. And so what did he do? You may remember he prayed for months. He prayed for months. Then he confessed the sins of the people of himself and was looking for intervention, spiritual intervention. So nearly five months later, after earnestly seeking prayer in this um, kind of mechanized as well as just off-the-cuff prayer process, he still remains for us a model of prayer life and he even prays from the Scriptures. So you'll notice as we look back in one of the sermons, he covers talking about Deuteronomy and it's almost word for word. So providentially, something in Nehemiah's appearance at the time when he was in the court prompted the king to ask what was wrong, what was so sad about him. And at that point, you can hear the ominous music, you know, da-da, because now there's a situation where he's in the court, the king knows he's sad, and we don't know what's going to happen. Then at that very moment we realize by reading the text that this is a sovereign moment 
Nehemiah may have been guided sovereignly to be cunning in how he, his mannerisms were or something of that nature, but he had the opportunity to inquire upon the king and tell him what was on his heart. So in this miracle format, King Artaxerxes happened to be favorable to Nehemiah and his pleas, and he grants him nothing that could be foreseen. In today's language, in our world, Nehemiah essentially captured that moment, and he was essentially asking for paid time off for a long time, a lot of paid time off. And he said, not only do I want that, I want you to give me supplies to take with me, an armed escort. Oh, and by the way, I'm essentially going to make myself governor of Jerusalem whilst I'm there. Are you okay with that? And apparently the king was, and that was a bold encounter. And we know the rest of the story from verse 8, which said, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of God was upon me. So let's pick up where we're going to be in the middle of chapter 2. If you would, let's rise for the reading of the word here today. Middle of chapter 2, verse 9 through 20. It is listed correct. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the king's river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sanballat the Hornonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Israel and was there three days. When I arose in the night and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate and the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Hornonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is the thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So please be seated. So some heavy text that we come upon this morning. The book of Nehemiah is often used as a, as a method to promote leadership examples. And it's also a frequent text to join the actions of piety and patriotic spirit. Now, while certainly Nehemiah was the lesser office holder here, Nehemiah had appealed to God for aid, received it, and acted to enforce the divine mission. Consider that in the 1600s, as people look back at Nehemiah, Puritan minister Jonathan Mitchell preached that Nehemiah was a praying magistrate and therefore so helped and blessed in his way and work who encouraged and assisted Ezra in the reformation of religion and put forth his authority to restrain and redress sundry abuses therein. This text clearly does have leadership lessons and obedience discussions in it. However, we must also see, I think more importantly, how the thread of Nehemiah's prayer life, which started in chapter 1 and is continuing through, and how it unfolds and blossoms. And we see a conflict of good and evil that is still directly applicable to us today. 
So just in our congregation alone, in our congregation alone, we know people. We have small groups. We have community. We have fellowship. Uh, we have issues of perseverance. And most importantly, this text, I think, of Nehemiah, this particular segment, is about real community interaction. It's about how we see each other. You see, the folks that Nehemiah was dealing with, the exiles, had persistent opposition. And we need to realize that the struggle for them between good and evil persists today same way. Like an undercurrent in the text, we can see these contrasting forces. It's not immediately obvious when you peruse through it and read through the text, but if you look at the root words, like when Nehemiah's face is said to be sad, the root word is similar to evil. Or if you look in verses 17 uh, or 8 or 18, where Jerusalem is said to be in trouble, that's a reference to evil. Alternatively, in verse 6, it was good to the king. And the what hand of God? The good hand of God is on Nehemiah. So this wasn't just a physical battle. Certainly, that's important. But the lack of fortification that they had exposed all sorts of dangers as they were surrounded. But the spiritual battle is what's emphasized here, at least as that's what we're going to focus on today. We see that the things that serve the interest of the exiles, such as the king's decision and the rebuilding of the walls, are good. While Sanballat's aspirations, Nehemiah's plan of grief and Tobiah and Geshep are akin to evil. So when we come to verse 10, where Sanballat and Tobiah are displeased, we have to realize that this conflict certainly has that supernatural implication to it. In Zerubbabel's day, back in Ezra 4, as well as with Tobiah, there's a deep and rooted antagonism, which is offensive and hostile okay, to anyone who would concern themselves with the exiles or their welfare. Further, Tobiah, Sanballat, and Gershom had considerable influence in the area. Uh, in that region, if you picture them individually, they were strong. If you picture them together, that's even worse. So here's the exiles, exposed, feeling shameful, and without the materials or organization to facilitate their recovery. Nehemiah, sorry, Nehemiah may not have been launching on an invasion or a war campaign, but the physical and spiritual resistance was truly a war of sorts. So regardless, we're going to see that Nehemiah's return will be welcomed and serve as a catalyst to spark their community well beyond what has been done in years. So let's look at the investigation of the walls. In verse 11, it says, So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. That's a long trip. And you'd think, okay, maybe he's going to rest for three days. I don't think that's the text, though, because he's been so fervent in his prayer life I can imagine where there is quite a stir. He shows up with supplies, a cupbearer from the king from miles and miles away. And so when there are contingent arrive, there must have been discussion among the exiles as to why is he here? Who's looking at us? Now, after all, if you look at the text and how it falls together, it's possible that Sanballat and Tobiah already knew that they were coming to seek the welfare of Israel before they got there. So somebody spread the word. But Nehemiah, at this point in time, doesn't say anything about his plans. Doesn't say what the cupbearer from the king's palace, 800 miles away, was thinking about doing. Now, his arrival was very different than what was recorded in Ezra. For, in Ezra. Let's look at uh, Ezra 8, 21 through 23. And it says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty." So, in contrast to Nehemiah, Ezra did not ask for any assistance from the king. 
Not that that was any less of a rescue effort. Ezra was there to teach, moreover, and Nehemiah was, had the building of the wall on his mind and seeking their welfare. And like in Paul in 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful, but not all things were helpful. So neither Nehemiah or Ezra was incorrect in what they were doing. It's just that God in his sovereign grace did not think that Nehemiah needed to have the armed escort, and Nehemiah didn't ask for it either, but it showed up anyway. So Nehemiah didn't tell anybody his plans. He kept it quiet, waited for three days. There are people who draft leadership principles from, from that. I'm sure that Nehemiah was considering in his prayer life what should be done. Then he secretly runs out and inspects the walls. His nighttime reconnaissance, so to speak, mentions that he went to the valley gate, dung gate, the fountain gate, and he's nearly circumvented the broken walls. So let's look at the text back again. It says, So I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. Then I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring, to the Dung Gate. Dung Gate, probably not the high rent district, I'm guessing. Um, I could be wrong, I don't know, but I would suspect that there's not a whole lot of realtors there. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the Fountain Gate and to the King's Pool, but there was no room for the animal. Then I went up by night by the Valley Gate, inspected the walls, and I turned back and entered by the Valley Gate and so returned. And the officials, it says nobody knew what he was doing. When he's done with his trip, do you suppose that he has now a visceral tie to what things look like? He had been praying for this before. He waits three days, then he secretly goes out at night. So everything was in considerable disrepair, burnt, broken, ultimately worthless for protection, and moreover, uh, the condition was embarrassing and must have caused him to reflect on the condition the exiles have been in for a long time. You know, you can hear the footsteps at night. You don't know what's approaching. That's a very difficult way to live. Now, when we consider the impact of Nehemiah, he was mournful and he prayed for the condition of the people. Now he has firsthand information yet he still exercised great restraint and had not said anything about what God had put in his heart to do. With this big of a task in front of him, he was going to have to approach the situation right the first time, okay, correctly the first time. After all, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. The text does not tell us that he had any background in architectural management, design, supplies, or anything of that nature. And further, and even more like that, he was still an outsider. So it's similar to having somebody from the king's restaurant show up and say, Hi, I taste the king's wine. I'm here to lead us as we build the wall of Jerusalem. Are you ready to go? And try and evoke confidence with that. That wasn't going to probably work. So even after his arrival, we don't have the indication that Nehemiah was going to rebuild the community and the walls. He kept that to the right time but he was always active and motivated in his community and implemented the vision of the restored city carefully. Let's return to our text in verse 16. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Now, we're kind of come to the point where Nehemiah is addressing the exiles. Until now, the mission and purpose of his trips is a secret, the walls are a shambles, indicate that the people may not have been unified in any direction. You know, there might have been small factions or groups that had made some type of an uneasy truce with Sanballat or, or uh, Tobiah or anybody else in the area, and that might have segmented the exiles' directions and attention and their interest in trying to move forward as one. So, his secrecy of intent and nighttime reconnaissance efforts aided that. And as we mentioned before, the battle is both physical and spiritual, and he knew that repair could not be accomplished by himself. Big task, an arduous task, a cupbearer for the king, none skilled in doing this. 
His first words were in verse 17, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. What did Nehemiah not do? He didn't blame them for their situation. These people were living in a gritty situation, okay? And he empathized with them rather than playing the part of some visiting official from the king's palace who's going to tell them that they're a mess. You know, why can't you pick up the pieces and do this? They don't have supplies. They don't have the ability to pull this thing together by themselves. And Nehemiah certainly knows he can't do it alone. He has to be in the community. So he had taken the time to really look at what was going on The city of Jerusalem was in ruins with burned gates. It's a heavy uh, sight to him, and he feels the the sense of both national and religious pride. But he has the moral truth behind him that the status of the exiles was not right for God's chosen people was clear. Let's move on to verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. With specificity, Nehemiah is exhorting the people of sorts to be a community in action. And we can see that they are strengthening their hands for the good work. He explains the background of how he arrived, and he carried with him the news that that of the hand of God that had been upon him, and also he emphasized that the king had granted him resources, which will become apparent uh, as far as how he's going to get resistance from that shortly. Undoubtedly, that's a shock to those people who were there, the exiles, who knew that the very same king is the one who had stopped rebuilding before. They have to have been sitting there and thinking, what changed? What changed? Moreover, not responding to the charges from Sanballat and Tobiah, which is in verse 19, from the local magistrates, so to speak, about potential rebellion against the king, Nehemiah encourages them with the promises of God and a prosperous future. He was not going to take time to listen to the counsel of the ungodly, okay? Which is calling somewhat from Psalm 1, Psalm 1, 1, I believe. One commentator who I looked at for this particular passage did liken Nehemiah's speech to the exiles with kind of a victory charge from somebody like Winston Churchill. So if you capture the moment, here's Nehemiah. He shows up, a restaurateur of sorts, with the task that he's going to try and tell everybody how they're going to pull things together. I think for us in North America, a better example might be to look at a speech that captures the moment on the stresses of life or a strenuous life by uh, Teddy Roosevelt, in which he said, we do not admire the man of timid peace. We admire the man who embodies victorious effort, the man who never wrongs his neighbor, who is prompt to help a friend, but who has those virile qualities necessary to win in the stern strife of actual life. Is community actual life. Yeah, it is. That's why here at First Baptist we have small groups. We have Bible studies on Wednesday nights. We have people who fellowship together for no other reason that they enjoy each other's company and kinship. And that's good. And we should be doing that on a regular basis. And that's a bond for us. Nehemiah was not rallying the people to a war of sorts with Jerusalem's neighbors, that's not the point. He was preparing them for a very big project, one that we'll see in further chapters of this book that does come with direct threats to them, their life, and their adversaries. So the chosen people of God first had to build their faith and come together as a community in the promise of God in order to rebuild the wall. See how the sequence moves? So our community of believers here, we are no different. Nehemiah was wisely acting in prayer. The message for us today is to build our community of faith. 
You see, the walls of Jerusalem were broken and in disrepair, right? Yet the battle, battle to repair them was being challenged in the spiritual realm as well as in the physical realm. Satan, in many ways, always tries to frustrate and resist God's work. Would you agree? That's always going to be a spiritual battle we know of. That's something we need to remember here in First Baptist Nixa. It's something we need to remember in our small groups Sunday mornings throughout the week. That's one reason we do have those small groups is that in structured and unstructured time in those intimate settings we can take prayerful action, right? We can take prayerful action. It's very difficult to show up in a, in a group or a uh, small intimate setting and come in and say, I know what your problem is. That doesn't go over well all the time, right? Now, you may have somebody who is empathetic with your situation, and that is so much better. Nehemiah didn't show up and tell them, you're a mess. Why didn't you do this? Blame them. That wasn't his point. He may have felt some of that, but that's not what he said. So we take prayerful action in our community groups, and we become familiar with the short-term issues that go on as well as the long-term issues that go on. Some problems don't get taken care of in a couple of weeks. They can go on a lifetime, right? Nehemiah is dealing with people who have been exposed for such a long time from all these sides in the area. Now, do we disagree in community groups and in the fellowship? Yes, we do, right? Often we may do disagree on a variety of things, but in doing so, that's the blessing of iron sharpening iron, right? And we are growing in sanctification together when we do so. I think it was Matt Chandler who said somewhere along the line that life in community groups has two components to it. It can be lovely and it can be ugly at the same time. And that's true. It can be lovely and ugly. So let's look at first, or uh, consider First John 8. You don't have to turn to it. It says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we con confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You see, the burdens that we face in community, just like the exiles, uh, have seasons to them. Sometimes they're heavier and they're tricky to deal with. But we can't be fooled into thinking that we are not spiritually bonded together, even though we have these varying degrees of trials and these differences of opinion as to how we're supposed to put this together in community. In Colossians 3, Paul urges the believers to a number of um, high-minded ethical imperatives, but Paul is not urging the people to refurbish themselves in order to be raised with Christ. No, he was, wanted them to know that they had already been raised with Christ. So as we look at the people in our community here, in the church, in your small groups, in the fellowship that we have, realize that. None of us are what we once were. Amen? None of us are what we once were. Right? And that should be our underlying motivation. Our spiritual bonds enable us to have this fellowship and this kinship, which is the spiritual bond. Now, we also build, much like the exiles, among opposition or amid opposition. The remnants of Jerusalem were physically surrounded. If you look at the gates and how they went around, they were physically surrounded by Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And from what we know, as I mentioned before, these are credible threats, together even worse. But this was no match for the moral truth that Nehemiah had brought to them, right? He was conveying that their community had a blessing, right? The good hand of God was being used with Nehemiah to bring to them. He's telling them that they're going to be prosperous. And today, we are the community of believers raised with Christ. So our confidence is in the Lord and His promises as, and intentions. In chapter 1 and 2, we see the inner workings. In Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2, we see that the inner workings of Satan cannot frustrate 
God's sovereign plan or had the good intentions for his people. When Nehemiah spoke to the people, he was not ignoring the assertions of disloyalty levied by Sanballat and Tobiah. He exhorted the people to know. He took, he took his, um, his people and he said, you know, Sanballat and Tobiah are saying, are you re rebelling against the king? And he responds and he says, in, his, in effect, take your eyes off of them and focus on what God has promised you, on who you are. Likewise, regardless of the worldly opposition that we run into, we need to build our faith together for good. You see, the big lesson here is that Nehemiah's final words were urging the people to clearly know the all-sufficiency of God. Clearly, to know that. That's where this segment of our text ends. Now, we've all been there in community. You can feel exposed, not having physical or spiritual support. We all know what it's like to hear the, the physical threats of somebody chopping at the tree you're in or running down the path. Uh, many years ago, when I was in a former line of work, uh, they decided that it was fun to take the boots out and uh, put you in a no-win situation with a canine chasing you and you had no gear to protect yourself. And that was uh, fun. Not for me, but um, it was fun. So I'm familiar with the pitter-patter patter of feet and teeth chasing you in more than one uh, way. Now, that motivator that Nehemiah came and he talked to the exiles showed that he built that bridge. He built the bridge. He was able to communicate with them. He saw what was going on. He didn't come in as a know-it-all. And what happened with that? And the people said, let us rise up and build, knowing what we know today on the sufficiency of Christ, prayer, and community. Do you think we ought to be bold in our kinship and trust his sovereign control? I'd say yes. We have a textbook here okay, that's the guide for life that shows us over and over again what has taken place. John Newton, everybody remember John Newton? used to write lots of sin, uh, hymns. John Newton wrote a, uh, this into a hymn uh, called The Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. I'm going to go ahead and read this. It says, Savior, since of Zion City, I through grace a member am. Let the world deride or pity. I will glory in your name. Fading are the world's vain pleasures, all their boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasures, none but Zion's children know. You see how that parallels with this text in Nehemiah? I think Derek Kidner had pulled this together originally. At the very end of our text, he repl Nehemiah replies to the people and he says, Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will rise and build. But you, referring back to Tobiah, Sanballat, and uh, Geshem, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. That covers past, present, and future. So our big lesson today is very simple. It's very simple. It's to support each other and trust God more than we do. We work in community to build each other up. We work in community to sharpen each other. And we should love our community the same way.